All right, uh, welcome everyone to the uh, third humanistic oh. psychology lecture of, uh, of William James College. So far, we've had three. Um, very excited about this year's uh, focus. Uh, we're gonna, I've invited uh, two very dear friends of mine to speak with us. Uh, Dr. Joe Cambray right here is gonna be speaking tonight, and then in two weeks, uh, Robbie Bosnack is going to be coming in and speaking also on the uh, 22nd, I think it is, two weeks from tonight. But uh, Joe is, is a, a, a very dear friend of mine. Um, I've known Joe, Joe for well over 25 years, I think, yeah, at this point. So, yeah. And uh, I did a lot of supervision with Joe over the years. I mean, I think we've worked on a lot of cases together and uh, got to see Joe uh, teach and to uh, also present at conferences. Um, he came to us today uh, from California, although he's the provost of uh, Pacifica Graduate Institute, which is really the one place in the country that really focuses on depth psychology. So um, Joe is the provost of, of that institution now. And, but previous to that, he's taught at Harvard and, and many different schools. He lectures all over the world. So I feel really privileged to have this opportunity to sit with him. And in the format that I like to to speak to, uh, just as I do in my classes, I really prefer this to be uh, an interactive experience. Uh, so what we're going to do for the evening is I'm going to start by just talking with Joe, and, and we're going to ask him a few questions to get things rolling. And then um, I might sort of ask him at some point, interrupt him very gently, and, and just sort of say, well, maybe could you slow that down? Could you say more about this? Or maybe you could expand this or put it into a clinical context, something like that. But uh, Joe is extremely knowledgeable in, in the theoretical aspects of analytic psychology. So it'll be really nice to sort of weave that together with the application of this type of practice in the humanistic perspective. So uh, let's get started, and we'll just sort of see where we end up. And we'll, I know we'll end up at 8.30, because they're going to kick us out. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll see what happens. So I thought maybe the place to start, Joe, would be just to say something a little bit about the nature of, of what the analytic field is, what we mean by field, the interactive field, mm -hmm. and uh, you know how it sort of helps generate the process, the healing process in terms of therapy. So if you could just sort of give us a little context and we'll get started with that. Well, oh, there's, yeah, it's a, it's a huge question. As I suspect many of you wrestled with it. I, whether you call it the interactive field, oh, hi, Susie. Yeah. Hi. Uh, the interactive field or the intersubjective field, um, it's a notion that uh, really goes back to interactions being uh, not simply contained within uh, individuals, but it's out of interaction between them that things get generated, so that it's relational at its core. Um, and it's, it's an entire vision of the world, quite frankly. I mean, one can go to, for example, there's certain sects in Buddhism that talk about the interconnectedness of all beings. That's a field model. Uh, and we have it in the West. Uh, I can give a little bit of history. William James was one of the key people in making the transition from physics to psychology of field models. But the idea uh, of an analytic field is that you have a, 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 two people in a room, a patient and a therapist, and they each bring the whole of themselves, whether they intend to or not. Some of it's repressed, some of it's unconscious sometimes pretty significant amounts of it, but you still co-construct an interaction between the two of you, and that um, by analytic training, one be can begin to listen to and hear that field and to see what's um, going on at a deeper level and what's being communicated, not just at the content level, but uh, the way the affect and the imagination is being constellated and being uh, influenced by the flow of what's going on between people. Uh, we'll give some examples of that. I think it's important. Uh, but the idea is that uh, we are never out of context. A mind is not alone. You know, it started with Winnicott saying things like, you know, there is no mother without a baby. There is no baby without a mother. That the mind is something that emerges out of human interaction. And that's what you're doing in the analytic field, in a way. Um, Tom Ogden has a, a way of framing this about losing your mind. You come to analysis and you lose your mind the way it was and you reconstruct it. You, this is part of what gets co-constructed. The way in which that co-construction can happen and what the different um, levels and the variables are become a bit of a theoretical difference. But I think in terms of clinical practice, 
I'll give some examples from Antino, uh, Antonino Ferro. He's a psychoanalyst in, in Italy, um, and not at all Jungian, but when I read his material, it feels extremely congruent with some of my own clinical work, the way he listens, the way he hears, the way things then transpire. Um, it's often a matter of um, part of the skill of learning to interact with the field is to develop what the poet John Keats called negative capability. And, and the field theorists tend to hold on to this. That is the ability to keep an open space in mind, to not know, to bear the tension of not knowing, uh, and just listen and feel the different, it's like hearing the music, the different emotional strains uh, that get activated, the kinds of reveries that get stirred up, that what, what gets going in your mind at just this moment with that patient. It can feel embarrassing. It can feel like, oh my God, I just dropped my attention. I'm no longer <laughs> listening to what my patient's saying. I'm off, you know, sort of gathering wool. But what's remarkable, if you practice this over time, you find that that seeming um, individual act actually um, is highly related to the field. And often you're listening at a, at a metaphoric level. And this is where Things like understanding something about the nature and structure of dreams is valuable because they are fundamentally um, metaphoric in their, in their construction. So when you're listening to them and you're hearing that, they also help tune you to the field. In fact, C.G. Jung said, you know, at the deepest level, we dream not out of ourself or out of the other, but out of what lies between. So it's, again, the, the pointing to a field of interaction that's um, that's operative as a kind of key component to this kind of thinking. So if you were to think to back to your own mm. clinical experience yeah. as you developed your own sort of sensitivity to working in this model, mm -hmm. uh, talk to us a little bit about your learning curve. Like how yeah. did you sort of experience, experience it initially and how did you, you're talking about learning how to listen to the field. Right. How does one develop that kind of capacity? Well, historically for myself, the trajectory went through, um, in the late 80s, there was a, a very strong interest in the, in the, in the U.S. in trauma. Uh, dissociation studies began to be um, rekindled. Uh, they had been out of fashion for a long time. Uh, the work of Pierre Genet uh, and so forth was recovered. And as people started to work with more fragmented states of mind, um, what happened was there was a large influx of these kinds of uh, patients into practice. And I had several of these patients. And quite frankly, some rather strange things started to happen in the, in the clinical cases. I'll give you an example. Great. Thank you. So this is a patient who uh, I was seeing initially two or three times a week, but because of the intensity of the material and the fragility of this person, I had to start to see four times a week. So it was a very intensive psychotherapy, to say the least. And this person had um, early childhood sexual abuse going back to age four. And it, I mean, it's a terrible story. I don't, I don't need to drag out all the details. I think many of you have heard cases like this. And the effect, of course, is that the mind is, is really in many ways shattered, even though the person may be brilliant. And they're often um, emotional tensions can't be borne by them. They, they can't be held in mind. And uh, you... The communications are not easy for the therapist to understand. And so a lot of the work was kind of containing acting out behavior for a while. Um, and that, that was somewhat frustrating for me as a clinician as I like to try to work at a little deeper level. But I realized that that process was beginning to create a space for us to be able to begin to talk, to begin to start to mentalize, to form um, the capacity to have a little more thought. And we reached a crucial point after about, I don't know, nine, ten months worth of work uh, at this four times a week, and I was going to be away. I was going to be away for uh, about a week, ten days. And the patient said, um, oh, I should back up. Uh, I generally had to hospitalize the patient every time I would go on vacation because she'd start cutting herself set fires, all kinds of self-harm, harm to others. Would, and, so, and she would go willingly. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't like I had a, a huge struggle on my hands. We just would say, you know, I'm going to be away. On, you know, and there would be anger about that, but the need for containment overrode uh, whatever desires we may have had. So finally, after this period of about um, nine, ten months of this intensive work like this, she said, you know, this time when you're away, I'd like to try to stay out of the hospital would you be willing to do one phone call with me? 
Okay, so that's a break of boundaries, right? You know, that's the first thing that comes up. It's like, hmm, interesting request. You know, will you, I think I can manage if you can manage to break the boundaries. Uh, and so I got some supervision from some people I know who are very skilled in, in um, trauma work. And their feeling was, and I, I have, you know, sort of moved on board. I think the, the you know, the Boston Process of Change study group and those people have done a lot of this kind of work. And they, I see similar kinds of uh, statements from them that sometimes with severely traumatized people, you really actually have to flex the frame. Uh, otherwise, there's no healing. You know, the, the, to just preserve the frame at all costs can be more damaging. It can be re-traumatizing. So with a lot of trepidation, I decided I would do this. I, I set up the call. Um, and this was at a time before there was, you know, sort of call tracing very easily. So <laughs> it <was laughs> that, it, it, and it's relevant because, uh, you know, I called at the exact moment. I said, I will call. I, I set the time and I said, I'll call you. Uh, because in part, I didn't want to give the number where I was at. Uh, I was in the Caribbean at the time. But the patient said, are you in Germany? That was the opening, opening line. I, I said, hello, this is, you know, so and so. And said, Are you in Germany? I was like, whoa. I, I said, well, tell me where that's coming from. And she said, oh, well, I had a dream last night. Very um, frenetic. You were in the black forest and I couldn't find you. You know, you were, lo you were lost to me. I mean, apparently I wasn't lost, but she was getting into the black forest and, and that was the whole dream. And I could see that the, you know, we were right on this fragmentary edge. The chaos was pretty close. And so I did a lot of things to help ground her in the kind of daily realities. Part of what we had agreed to is that she would see her psychopharmacologist several times during the week uh, as a, a further containment to not going in the hospital. And so we talked about that. And in fact, the truth of the matter is it worked. Uh, we got out of the phone call. She um, felt more solidly connected to reality. She was less frightened about my just disappearing. The abandonment anxiety came down, at least within manageable realms. And in fact, she managed to stay out of the hospital the whole time uh, without doing anything particularly onerous. And that was the last of the need to hospitalize. I mean, that was a, there was a, a terminus for that. So at that level, it was an interesting success. But it doesn't say much about field yet. Uh, and that didn't start for me until the next day. Um, I was in the Caribbean, and um, one of the things I'd always wanted to do was learn to scuba dive. So I began um, a short course in diving, which was fun. Uh, it was really very nice. And the dive instructor and I developed a friendship. And he, you know, after the morning of working in the pool, he said, "Look, why don't you come on the, the dive this afternoon? Uh, we're going to go out." To, and it's, an, it's a curious mix of people who go on these dives. Most of them were firemen from the Northeast. Because <laughs> they do all this rescue diving, you know, in the cold, nasty rivers, and, and they just love getting into this warmer, clear water. So it's, uh, you know, it was interesting to listen to their stories as to why they, they went diving. So, I, you know, I was fairly anxious, but this, um, I had a rather positive transference to my dive instructor. Because he was, a, he was an ex-Navy SEAL, and he had me at the bottom of the pool. We took all the gear apart, completely apart. Bra we were breathing off, of the, uh, off the tank itself, which felt a little impossible to me until he showed me how to do it. And then sort of reconstruct everything all the way back up. So that tended to build some confidence in him. And he said, look, I'll be your dive buddy when, when you um, go on this, um, on this dive. So, uh, with a little trepidation, I got on the boat with everybody, sort of tried to be friendly. And then after about a 45-minute boat ride, he called us all around. And he said, let me tell you about today's site. It's called the Black Forest. Oh, like, oh. wow. <laughs> oh, my God. It's like, okay, what do I do with this? You know, do I go, do I jump into this now? Or yeah. do I, you know, how am I going to regulate myself on this? And it took me you know, a couple of minutes to sort of settle myself down, process my own anxiety, mm -hmm. and say, you know, this patient has picked something up here. And, you know, how much should I worry about mm -hmm. her precognitive abilities in a certain kind of way? Uh, am I going to get lost? Well, it turns out black forest mm -hmm. in this context meant black coral, which is a, you know, a very precious and rare kind of coral. In fact, it's illegal to import it now. This was just at the beginning of that era. When that, was, when that was starting to stop, where divers were no longer allowed to take it out of the country. 
So it was at 30 to 60 feet underwater. And we, there was this whole forest of black coral, and it was exquisite. It's one of the more transcendental moments of my life, actually, this kind of silent journey into this deep underwater realm and to witness this. So by the time I got back up to the boat, I, I had a couple of moments of awakening uh, about the case. I mean, first off, I realized this patient's much deeper uh, tied into me at an unconscious level than I have heretofore acknowledged. You know, I was treating her from a kind of more objective clinical perspective, and this blew a lot of that <laughs> out of the water, as it were. You know, it's like, no, no, there, there's something far deeper going on with this. Um, and I realized one of the things in terms of a field model, because uh, I was beginning to, to explore and think about the field, I, I like to think about the field as, as holding images. They kind of, uh, they're emergent properties of a field that you interact and um, it's like figures in a dream get com composed to get pu pulled together. And the black forest was, the f was an image of the field that she and I were both in. And I realized we were both in a black forest. Well, they, we were just from radically different vertices. We were entering the field from different places. She was entering it from childhood trauma and terror. It was a world of goblins and ghosts and fairy tale horrors, that kind of black forest, Grimm's fairy tale kind of world. And mine was this dive world. Uh, but I realized, no, we're still within the same image in some ways, even though we are experiencing it in a radically different way. And of course, the first thing it raised for me was, what's this mechanism of communication? You know, what is, the, what is the pathway of communication? How, in heaven's name, could she have pulled this black forest thing out the night before? I mean, uh, I didn't know it. It isn't like I could give some kind of uh, unconscious somatic cue that would have pointed in this direction. I mean, I didn't even tell her about diving. Um, and I realized, again, with these unmentalizable states, that a lot of that energy pours into the field. That, the, the, that which cannot be thought, that which cannot be born by somebody. You know, the old language was projective identification. You know, they put the feeling inside of you. And that's always felt a little bit uncomfortable to me because it's a, it's a really pathologizing kind of metaphor if you, you look at it. It's like, you're the ill patient, you put your bad feelings in me, I'm the healthy analyst and I'll take care of them, you know, everything is fine. When in fact, I think there's a kind of mutual illness that gets going. There's a bit of psychic infection. I certainly felt that with this black forest. Like, the first thing I got hit with was anxiety. What, what, have, what in heaven's name am I getting into? So the question was then to see what was the black forest doing? What was it about? What was it a metaphor of? Um, that, that became a challenge over the next couple of years, actually, of our clinical work. I mean, certainly it was about the unconscious. You know, a black forest is not a bad image of unconsciousness in general. But what became really stunning is about two months after I got back from my trip, having never said where I was, having never discussed my interest in diving, there's nothing in my office like that, she started to have a series of dreams in which she was underwater and drowning, mm -hmm. and I would come along and help rescue her by using a technique called buddy breathing. If any of you dive, what you do is you have, if, some, if your partner's regulator goes bad, if there's something with their air equipment that goes bad, you take yours, you take a breath, and then you give it to them, they take a breath, and then you take a breath and you share in this way here you can get yourself back to the surface and get back to land. So unconsciously her psyche again picked up a very fundamental metaphor that was taking prominence in my life and she began to, she began to use me in ways that I didn't realize I was usable <laughs> in a way. I mean in other words I would say that her psyche was actually in some way supervising the field was supervising the analytic process. Uh, so if you could, let's slow that yeah, down a tiny sure. bit. So you've introduced this idea of the, the therapist or analyst getting infected by the patient, the yeah. psychological, mm -hmm. affective realm entering into the That's therapist right. realm. And uh, so, and you also suggested that there was a way in which you're, you had to manage and, and deal with your own anxiety. Yes. I think to, one of the hardest things to learn seems to me in terms of developing a relationship with this kind of technique is how to tolerate that kind of experience of, in your example, being used, if, mm -hmm. if we could say that, by the patient. So talk to us about that too as you, as you continue this. Like, What is that like in terms of you developing this kind of tolerance for that? Yeah, I mean, well, what are the things that help with resilience and t building of tolerance? 
for me, first, it's recognition that anxiety tends to narrow the focus, tends to you know, sort of do that to you. And the anecdote or antidote for me is curiosity. When that starts to happen to me, I generally tend to be, at this stage of my life, become curious. Huh, I wasn't anxious before. Why am I anxious now? What's going on? What's happened in this that is producing that anxiety? I mean, one of the things before I go into analytic sessions um, that I tend to want to do is take a, a psychological reading of myself. What's up for me? You know, have I just got an email that's irritated me? So am, am I bringing some anger or some annoyance or am I bringing something happy? And, or am I feeling sort of, sort of more plain? And whatever's going on that day, to notice what I'm bringing into the session so that when affect gets stirred during the course of the hour, because I listen and I, they, they do tend to use my own affective responses and my own reveries, to see what, where the disturbances are. Uh, it's tolerating being disturbed uh, and using the disturbance as a tool. I mean, I do think the best instrument you as a therapist have is your, yourself. So if using sort of like a tuning fork metaphor or something like this, what are you resonating to in the sessions? I mean, I think it's important to be careful about owning what's yours. This is part of the delicacy of this is how to parse this. You can never say, well, that's my, all mine or that's all yours. But why? Why am I having just this fantasy at this moment? You know, I think that's an important thing. So with this patient after the Black Forest, I paid a lot more attention to things like her dreams and to her utterances that seemed peculiar or odd. And I began to watch what they stirred up in me and to begin to try to go a little deeper in myself, to be able to think about why that should affect me or something else should affect me. And I so so that, that's a really interesting moment to me is that yeah. how do we take that translation mm -hmm. of our experience and then give it back to the patient in a way that doesn't shame them or sort of shift them back into their experience right. to get that kind of reflective space that you're talking about. Yeah. Talk yeah. about that a little bit. Well, it, some of it's, uh, in fact, I would say it's always context dependent. And one of the questions is whether you speak out of the transference or you speak about the transference. I tend to lean more in the direction, sometimes I'll interpret the transference when I think it's the right moment and it's necessary, but I much prefer to speak out of it. That is, to register my experiences and speak out of what I'm experiencing, not saying you did this to me or I think this is, to explain it. I, I don't do much explanatory work. I, early on in my career I did and I found it didn't help. <laughs> it, it seemed to be more about me showing, you know, that I, I was competent and clever and I could figure out these things than it did it wasn't of much help to people, so I thought, eh, is this really the thing to do clinically? And I thought, no. So let me give a, another example then yeah. of something yeah. like, like this. This was um, this is a much higher functioning individual and more neurotic in their character structure. And this was, um, again, another, and often this, this is the case, it was a day of a, a break. I was going to be away. It was a different break than the previous one, but I was going to be away for a few days. Um, and this was somebody I was seeing once, twice a week, so it was uh, less um, intense therapy. And it was a, this was a person, he was a successful businessman, um, had um, some early childhood stuff around, he was adopted, so that, that stirred the pot for him, you know, some of the feelings of absence and so forth. And on this day, we had a, the back and forth was, you know, sometimes, it's hard to keep the therapeutic alliance going. It's, the, things are a little flat. There's affect underneath there, but it's hard to get to. And it was one of those where you run into one of these kind of flat spots. And so I, I just let it sit without, without trying to hurry up and try to push him into something. I wanted to just see what, what was going on. So uh, as I let myself um, just sort of lean back into my own reverie, I was stunned because suddenly a dream from the night before came back. Now that's a rare experience. I mean, usually if I'm gonna remember a dream, I do it when I wake up in the morning, not in the middle of an analytic session. I thought, whoa. And the dream was very simple. It, it, I was studying a bunch of alchemical prints at the time, and this was a, one of a flask in which there were three dead birds, a black bird, a white bird, and a red bird. And that, that was the image. Um, and as I had that, as that came back and I went, huh, I looked at the patient and I saw sort of a dissociative gleam uh, on his face. 
And so I tried to gently just say, where are you? And in fact, it was shaming. He got defensive at first and, and said, you know, oh, oh, I was just thinking about something. And I knew that we were on to something important, so I said, look, um, I just found myself kind of drifting a bit. I didn't go into the content of what I recalled. I just said, I, found my, I also found my mind drifting, and I was just curious about what was happening between us at that moment, because this was a kind of, it felt like a, something in the field. The reverie felt like it wasn't just mine, even though it was my dream, because of the way it, it, the way it had emerged in this particular kind of moment. And then he proceeded to tell me a story that after two and a half, three years of therapy, this is the first time I'd heard this story. So it was really a very interesting moment in that sense. But he had, um, I knew he had had an older brother who was adopted, but this became the story of the day the older, or the, excuse me, the younger brother, the day the younger brother was brought home from um, the adoption agency. And my patient had gone over to, he was a bit despondent, as you can imagine. He was a bit depressed by the kind of intrusion of a, a foreign alien sibling wasn't even a blood relationship. I mean, that's a, a pretty powerful event. And he went over to his neighbor's uh, house to play, and he accidentally fell into the pool, which was empty, and he knocked himself unconscious for a couple of minutes. He got up and then went home and never told anyone else again. Uh, and this was the first time he'd we had to, it was, it was repressed. We had to de-repress the memory and then he brought it forward and then the question for him was, well, what was the meaning of this? And, you know, it was, we had to be very gentle, but he, he could recognize that there was something suicidal in, in his despair and how that had been impacting his, both his business relationships and his interpersonal relationships. So this became a kind of key piece to get a hold of, the, the kind of moment of despair when something's being introduced that's just not tolerable and there's nowhere to go with it. There's no one to turn to. So you're suggesting in some way, if I get it, that um, there's some kind of unbearable affect yeah. that he's struggling with. In that and moment. there's something about your connection to him through the image and the reverie that you yeah. had that somehow contributed to the processing and containment of the affect. Yes, when you explore the image, my, my dream image, I would almost say it was dreamt anew in that session. Uh, if you study the um, alchemical authors of this, they say about the three black, uh, the black, white, and the red bird, they're, they're uh, sulfur, mercury, and salt, and that the birds are sort of the animated principle, but they've been at war and they've either killed or knocked themselves out. And reading that application was quite striking because when you think about what happened to him, in other words, these blows to the head that knock something out of the mental field were, were being represented to me in my way and to him in his way. And so there you can see how the analyst reverie was in fact part of the field communication and that by staying with that and not telling it to him, it, there would have been very little point to have told him this obscure alchemical imagery. He would have just looked at me and gone, yeah, that's nice. Okay, <laughs> um, but rather to, to speak out of the, the kind of disruptive effect that the imagery was having, that we could <clears throat> from there begin to tap back into his own disrupted states and some of the, the origin points there. And it taught me to respect my own reveries even more. That's, this, is <clears throat> this was really one of the incidents where I began to pay a lot more attention to um, seeming uh, the non sequitur kind of material that would come into the mind that I had tried for so long to edit out. <laughs> and I think this is where you can see, and, and, and I do see that as a kind of infection, if you will, I mean, you can use that language, or a co-constructed shared interactive field. I mean, Ed Tronick at Harvard, uh, he's a developmental psychologist, talks about a dyadic expansion of consciousness, starting with mother-infant relationships and I would say these kind of moments, these field moments, tend to open up. They tend to have this feeling of uh, something new being allowed to emerge. I mean, my own personal theoretical interests are in what are called complex systems. These are systems where you've got a lot of parts and they're not just complicated. My watch is complicated, right? You know, I, you can explain everything that happens if you understand the mechanics of the watch. So it's a complicated system, it's not a complex system. A complex system is something when the interactions start to pursue something more than you can get from the parts. So very simple things. Why is water liquid at room temperature? 
Uh, it turns out it has to do with the hydrogen bonding between molecules, not the individual properties of the molecule. And it, it turns out nature is full of this, this kind of complex system. Why is it important? Well, these um, holistic properties, these larger emergent properties, appear uh, most commonly at the edge of order and chaos, which I think is a description of where the field is most active. That this, psychologically, what we're looking at is creating the conditions under which there's enough chaos, um, but enough order, so that something brand new can emerge. I mean, you can take go back to that story of the Black Forest, and I, what you can see is that my patient came in in a sort of hysteric, uh, very chaotic state. I overcompensated with lots and lots of rational order, enough to package her back up, but then the kickback, the unconscious kickback, was the chaos inside of myself, which only was realized once I got to the diving incident in the, the Black Forest. And that begins to give you a feeling for, oh, it's right at that edge when you can begin to attend to that. So it's another tool for the therapist who wants to work in field phenomena to look at this kind of balance of order and chaos. To not so there's something about like old structures, say defensive yeah. structures that, That's right. that hold together and there's something about the necessity of them coming apart in a way that will allow something new to happen. That's, That's what right. you're talking about, yeah. right? Yeah. And how to, how to sit with that and how to work with that where you're not, make, not leading too much to chaos right. and not, not sort of supporting too much the, oh. the, uh, the order. That's right, to overstructure it. The well, let, let's go a little farther with that. So, you know, Jung has said and other people have said that uh, you know, healing happens mostly in the unconscious, mm -hmm. right? So, and, and you may or may not agree with that. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> let's talk about that in terms of the. I'm trying to bring us closer to the process yeah, that sure. gets generated. So, you have a moment where um, the person has tolerated your going away yes. without being hospitalized. Um, take us more into the process, the healing process for her. Mm -hmm. as in terms of the field as you saw it um, unfold and, and kind of connected to, I'm thinking about, you know, the idea of archetypes and, sure. um, you know, sort of uh, numinous moments that sort of contribute to the healing process. Yeah, that's, that's tricky because I think that depends on the psychological state of the, the people involved. I don't think all numinous things, I mean, her dream of the Black Forest was a numinous dream in a way, but it was at that point it was creating more chaos for her because it was engendering an enormous amount of anxiety. So I think the question here is container contained also has to be considered. You have to have built an, a, a strong enough analytic vessel uh, through your, the history of your interactions that there can be some trust that uh, there will be understanding of these communications. Because if there's going to be anything, I, if the relationship is to be healing, uh, I think it's the healing of uh, truly understanding the communications at depth, not just can I cognitively um, decipher the meaning of them. That's only one narrow sliver of understanding. I think understanding the affective dimensions to that and the imagistic dimensions and their implications, that um, a trust that even if I don't know the answer, and it often isn't something that can be delivered on the spot in the moment, it's that it can be held and held um, profoundly over time. So the, and this is where I really uh, am an advocate of long-term psychotherapy because I think you have to develop um, a sense of the lexicon of the patient. What is the language they speak uh, with? I mean, it's their metaphors that seem to me that are the communicative field and it's how you work in that field of their metaphors that you learn to contain them, you learn to hear them, um, and you learn to respond. Uh, let me tell you that one of Pharaoh's cases I like this one in particular because it, it's Jungian and it's synchronistic in a way. He has a woman in patient, he has a woman patient in analysis with him, and he notices that he's disturbed. He notices he's over-interpreting. He's going on and on and on. He feels like he's sort of flooding the woman with her with his interpretations, but he can't quite stop himself. She calls between that session and the next session, says, I can't come in. Mm. And she says, because the, the Ticino is flooded, the river has flooded. There's no passageway to get, literally, you know, this is on the external world. The, things have flooded and there's no way to get through. She comes to the following session and she's feeling much better. He's certainly getting the message. Um, and she talks to him about studying Tai Chi, 
you know, the, the Chinese you know, sort of boxing method. And you would have to be Italian to know this. I mean, you read it. He's got a book called Seeds of Illness, Seeds of Recovery. This is from that book. And in there, what he says is, is that the pronunciation of Tai Chi is very close to the Italian, which means keep silent. <laughs> so he is listening, and he gets the message. I'm, I flooded her last time. Uh, and she's experienced this flooding. And he's able to pull back in such a way that gives the patient more room. And now the, the, the river's dried up, and she's able to practice this new methodology. And uh, uh, it's working well for her. She's starting to feel healthy. And then he, he follows it up with the next patient, uh, who is a man who has a dream about this uh, very lean, dry character uh, butchering a cow with a knife and, and killing it. Um, and the cow screaming, and the man wakes up in sort of a, a sense of high anxiety. And the patient fundamentally interprets the transference elements of this back to Pharaoh. And he, his, he in a very good-natured way, takes the, this as a kind of corrective, that he realized that he was out of balance with these patients, and that each one of them is giving him feedback. He, they're supervising him in a subtle sort of way, saying, you know, if you listen to their derivatives, they're telling you what's wrong in the field. And if you listen to it and hear the metaphors, then sure enough, you begin to alter. And within a few days, that dissipates uh, for both of these patients. I mean, the other one in, in there, just to give you a yeah. little more feeling like this, is, is a woman who comes in and says her father has um, some kind of um, thrombosis in his eye. And she's enraged that he's driving. He, he, he's blinded one eye. He, this just happens. And he, he's continuing to drive. And he, she's all upset. And he's listening to it and listening to it analytically and hearing, that, you know, whoops. Am I? So he starts thinking about, well, what am I being blind to? Now, he doesn't say that to the patient. Do you think I'm missing something here? I mean, that would be an OK interpretation in my mind. But it would be sort of, you know, sort of ham-fisted in a way. You're, you're being quite concrete about it. But he began a process of self-reflection. And he began to pay attention to what he wasn't talking about that he was missing, and began to slowly introduce that subject matter into the therapy. And she heard. She got what he was doing. She comes back three days later and says, you won't believe it. My father's uh, thrombosis has gone away. He can now see out of both his eyes. Yeah. I mean, so there's a whole psychosomatic layer to this thing. You know, it's a very curious sort of thing. So the power of unconscious communication, infection, it's not just between the two people in the diet. I, I think it tends to be much broader. There's a, a sociological study that Malcolm Gladwell published uh, a discussion about that I, I still don't know what to do with. But I'll tell you because it, it more than likely will be of interest to some of you. So this was a study on weight gain and loss. Um, and the study had intended to pick up uh, the influence of one's friends. You know, that's fairly obvious. You, you'd imagine you do a social study and your, your friends' changes correlate with your own. Well, it's not true. They don't. But what's really bizarre is your friends' friends correlate. Now, it's a correlation. It's not, a, it's not causal. I'm not saying anything like that. But the data's there. You know, it's just social data that's out there, that there's some kind of communication that seems to have taken place, that the friends' friends, you go out three, and the, the effect completely washes out. There's no more effect. So there's something there in that field. And I say this because I've, over the years, been very interested. I wrote one paper on this about how patients communicate through the therapist, especially on the same day. I'll watch a charged day, and something happens in one hour. I, I first did this with children. I was working at one point in my life with young, younger children. And I did a lot of what was called sand tray or sand play. And when I would do that, if there was a particularly numinous or charged tray, the central object of that tray was picked up by almost every kid who came in afterwards that day. And I was like, what's on here? You know, what's, what's going on? What's left? There's some residue, some psychic residue that seems to be there. I mean, how do these kids, no matter what I would do, I clean up the room, I put everything away neatly, you know, all that rational stuff. Not, they come in, and someone would just hold it, someone would just sort of put it down on the couch or do something else with it. But it was shocking that, you know, like 80 to 90 percent of them would somehow want to interact with something that had some kind of psychic charge to it. So the question was then, at least to me, is, is there not some communicative field? There are residues from one session that, that begin to influence. And there's conversations that go on unconsciously between patients. 
why do you schedule these patients on this day? You know, I've always got reasons why I do it consciously. But, I, you know, over time I begin to know, well, you know, I tend to get a little sleepy after lunch. There are certain patients who help keep me more awake, you know. <laughs> you know, who I'm going to put in the early morning, who I'm going to put maybe in an evening slot. And in that, in that deliberate conscious choice, there are a, a variety of unconscious dimensions to the choice that are also present that are actually influencing uh, these fields. So I see it more even than a field as a network of fields. And it's, and it's learning how to be open to that network yeah. of communication that's happening. Yeah. And then to translate that back into the room in some way. Yeah, I mean, this is the value of process notes for me. Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, I don't take rigorous process notes anymore. I kill myself if I did that. But I, I do try to take cl some clinical notes and try to observe and uh, capture odd moments or things that are, you know, not only the main theme of the hour, but uh, little oddities that I don't know quite how to integrate. And oftentimes, when I read then longitudinally back over those, and I, I would sometimes do that when I'd go to supervision, I would read through maybe 10 sessions or so uh, of a case that I felt particularly curious about. I would start to see other things that were, ha that were connecting those sessions that had not necessarily always been brought to consciousness, but that had a dynamic impact on the therapeutic diet. And could see then, and we, we talked a little bit about this, how that could affect the supervision because I think there's a whole supervisory field in addition to a therapeutic field. Uh, yeah, say more about that. Yeah. I think that's really important. That why do I bring this case to this supervisor at this moment? You know, I mean, I'm fairly conscious about choosing supervisors uh, for expertise. I mean, it's sort of like, okay, so-and-so knows about this. I really like what they've written and how they speak about that. I'll ask, the, I'll ask their advice. But it almost always goes into something more than that kind of deliberate conscious choice. Usually there's something else um, that's in the field of, that has to do with something else dynamic that's longed for that isn't quite co you know, it hasn't yet taken full shape. And so by following that process in the supervision, um, there's a kind of self-analytic process that can be stirred by that. And I think good supervision does that. For me, the goal of supervision is not to turn out clones. It's to help people become more fully the super, the, the clinician that they are. Uh, and that often is a, sometimes a, a quite different than, than I would. I, I spent three months last year in Japan uh, at Kyoto University, and I, it, was, it was a tremendous learning experience for me because I would be presented cases on a regular basis. I did a lot of supervision. I'd be presented cases. And I'd read through the case, and I could see, oh, yeah, there's clinical progress. I have no doubt. I can see that this person is more flexible. They have a greater range of choice. There's all kinds of good things happening. But these interventions make no sense to me at all. You know, it's like, so how did you get from here to here? You know, I ended up, and I had to just be um, almost like a child asking questions. And what I began to learn about was the way their language functions and how radically different that is from the way English functions and that this structured the therapy sessions. So that it's completely rude to ask direct questions. So first thing I got was the anamnesis didn't come until the end of the case. You never knew what the full story was until you got to the very end. You know, instead of the way we normally kind of get that garner that information up front, but to do that in that social context would be to just alienate someone and they would walk out of treatment. Instead, what the art of it's listening in between. So what they listen for is what's, what's tolerable and what's permissible to the patient at this moment. And so they listen to, uh, say, a fight with a boss or something, you know, something a little more affectively present comes in there. Then that's permission. Then it's permission to explore that realm or that realm. And so it's a much more um, circuitous, indirect route. It's a much more nonlinear way of approaching psychotherapy. It would be very hard to manualize. Uh, it's not completely different than analytic listening, though within the context of their society, the way in which it's structured um, is so radically different because Japanese grammar is um, not so um, nuanced as English, but it's about levels of politeness. It's about social relationships, and you have to understand all the time who, where you stand in social relationship to the other. That's what you can say and what you can't say. Um, and so part of the dynamic between the therapist and the patient in that cultural context means uh, sort of working within 
within the expectations, the cultural values and norms, and the way those are going to shape what stories emerge at what particular moment. And so once I had some of those kind of tools, then I could begin to make sense of why the, the kind of erratic trajectories from my, from my Western perspective were there. And I thought, well, that's not actually bad in terms of learning about the inner world of most patients. I mean, there is, what are the rules? What are the kind of grammars of uh, their uh, unconscious communications? What does their unconscious respond to and how? Yes. So I'm, I'm thinking it'd be good to have one more case in the room with us, if you could okay. talk about that, and then maybe we'll sort of turn it over and, and get some questions and, and okay. try to develop that some. But I was thinking what, what might be nice is um, you've been talking about this idea of emergent moments. Mm -hmm. and, um, and obviously this question of how does, uh, in terms of the healing process itself, uh -huh. how does someone sort of, what's the relationship between images right. and affect in terms of the capacity to integrate experience? Uh, I think talking about images here would be really helpful right. to people and, and to, to sort of help learn how to really be, be with images. Yeah, the, the trick in that question is we tend to be a kind of TV-driven society so that we think of images as visual pictures. And um, I think that can be mistaken uh, for a true image sense, like, say, dream images. Um, because I think the, the internal world of imagery always has affect with it. Now, sometimes it's split off. Uh, so just knowing the image alone, just the pictorial dimension of it is inadequate. I, I, that's why I'm, I'm cautious, because it isn't just a matter of, oh, if you get the picture right, then, you, then the case is solved. I, I think it's feeling into the, the full um, manifold of what is being communicated through the image. I, I'm somewhat of a fan of Tony Damasio, you know, the neuroscientist. And he more and more is leaning in the direction that First off, affect is at the base of all co cognition. I mean, I think neuroscience is heading there, uh, pretty much, so we can we can feel good about that that level of uh, therapeutic work. But he's seeing the images of the imagination as being the kind of self communications from that kind of um, you know sort of synthesis of sensory and affective materials into a communication that that the uh, the mind can begin to um, come into some relationship with. So. Understanding one's own image system, the metaphors in which you speak, what you think, helps you to begin to communicate uh, intrapsychically, you know, across your own contact barrier, to use Beyond's term. Uh, and what's healing about this is these images, taken in, in the way that I've described them, are more holistic. They, they, re they are representations of a whole system, not just bits and pieces. And so they have a synthetic and integrating component to them. And I think that is uh, of, of great value when you can touch into something. Each one of these moments that I've given you, like the black forest or you know, uh, the moment with the Japanese or what have you, all of these are um, when the image feels alive in the room, the, the, the dream flask and the, the, the being knocked out, there's a feeling of animation that's present in the image when it's there. And the person feels more fully alive and more fully present, and they're part of something larger. There's a more holistic feeling. And that usually has a transformative effect. So I think, for example, with the Black Forest Dream, there was something about that that gathered up all of the fragments, or gathered up enough of the fragments uh, for that person with the kind of shattering of her mind that held enough of the fragments that there could be some kind of beginning synthesis. And I think that's experienced internally as a, a knitting together. It's a little bit of Humpty Dumpty coming together again. So I think that is the sense of wholeness that might be there um, has, in a Jungian sense, a kind of archetypal, a deep transpersonal uh, human experience. There's, I don't think you can find uh, many societies where some sense of wholeness isn't of, of great value and often part of healing rituals. Think of Native Americans, uh, say the Navajo and their sand painting and things like that. You can go around the world and find these kind of things. Or young children, when they first learn to draw, their first drawing of a, a person is usually a circular figure. And then they put, start putting appendages on. That circular figure is a representation of self. Uh, if you see somebody with severe neurological deficits, for example, they can't do that. 
and that sense of impairment is there. So there's something about the experience of um, feeling complete and whole in oneself and being contained in that that I think is um, a fundamental aspect of healing from a lot of trauma. Yeah, that's important. Um, let me just extend that question I'm trying to because sure. it, it reminded me of something that you've written about, which is um, thinking about the, the therapist experience of the field. Yeah. And you've talked a lot about the necessity of the thera therapist having empathy for uh, their own experience. Yes, yes, I have. Yeah. And I don't think that's talked about enough. So maybe in the context of a case, or maybe you just want to expand and relate to another case, let's, let's sure. think about that together a little bit too. Oh, yeah. Like, what does that look like? Well, yes, I mean, I, I've made a number of jokes, as you've heard, of going along at my own expense, <clears throat> which are part of this. I mean, it's, it's being able to be amused by one's failings rather than being driven by superego criticism. Mm -hmm. Because I, I, in the years of supervising people, I found that's one of the worst things that happens, is that they get dominated by superego kind of constraints about how they're to talk to their patients. Mm -hmm. And I remember one supervisor, the aphorism that most sticks to mind is never interpret out of a negative countertransference. And if it's super ego driven, it's going to be negative, uh, quite, quite definitely. Because, and the, the reason behind that is that if you interpret out of a negative countertransference, it doesn't matter how accurate you are. You may be laser correct in what you're saying. And I can give you some examples of this where I've made this error. Uh, the person will be infuriated they will be infuriated because they feel the sort of uh, sadistic edge to that kind of communication. So there's something about having to know th those affects and be able to contain and hold them and not ch and to choose not to deliver it at that particular moment. Um, I can talk about another couple of clinical errors I, I've made. I remember very early on when I was in analytic training, one of the cases that I had, very bright scientist, and he got enamored of dream work and knew that I was in a kind of an analytic training and I used dreams a lot. So he began to produce this series of dreams that were really remarkable. I mean, I won't go through all of them, but they were really quite extraordinary. And, um, you know, I still may have at that time had a little bit of the belief that the image is enough. If, if you dream this, then, you know, that, that will have a, a curative effect in and of itself. Well, I would go home every week after our sessions and I would work on his dreams because I got really interested in them, until finally he got really angry with me, and rightly so. And he said, you're changing, I'm not. And he was right. I mean, <laughs> the thing that was peculiar was his dreams were changing. And I had always taken that, if the unconscious is showing signs of transformation, then the personality is changing. But I hadn't taken the time, slowed down enough, to link ego consciousness to the transformations that were happening. And he was, rightly, he was rightly feeling cut out. He was seeing I was having a good old time with his unconscious. The, the communications to the analyst were wonderful. Suddenly there were these you know, jazz musicians starting to, to come up and all kinds of things were flowering. And yet he couldn't feel it in his own life. And I, it really was a very strong lesson in terms of, not to beat myself up because that would have just been to incorporated his superego. <laughs> that, was like, that was an enactment of, yeah, sort, exactly. of his experience. Yeah, exactly. So, and so you got it, and he, he corrected you. Yeah. And then did you have a moment of empathy for yourself there? Or yes. like, talk, talk a little bit about that corrective inside yeah. of you. Well, I, first off, I, I did feel very badly when he said this. I mean, I, I saw the truth of it. And then I had to say, you know, well, why? What, what led me to this? And I began to realize, oh, it was this belief system I'm holding. And, you know, the empathy was... Uh, as far as I was concerned, uh, that I had, to, uh, I had to sacrifice that belief system and I could feel the suffering that was involved in that. And to so say, way okay. way protecting yourself from his feeling. Yeah, yeah, rather than being open to what communication channels were blocked and I had to open that up. I had to use my own empathy towards the sense of um, what it's like to feel cut off. Why was I putting so much energy into taking his dreams so seriously? when he wasn't. I wasn't putting enough pressure back on him. And I realized, well, yeah, I'm using these to heal something in myself. And so beginning to, to take that more seriously on board uh, was an act of empathy. Oh, I've got, a, I've got a piece here that I'm trying to work out through him, and I need to work that out on my own. Um, and I'm glad, to, and I, I was genuinely glad to have been given that opportunity. 
I mean, in that sense, I'm very grateful to the case. You know, even though it went through a bad patch for a while, it, it actually taught me something fundamental and got me to work on something I might not otherwise have worked on. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. And well, if, I had, if I had just blocked it and tried to repress it, that, that wouldn't have happened. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's sort of open it up to people's questions and, and some thoughts that you're having and, and maybe link it to a case that Joe might have talked about. And yeah. What I'd love it is if people could take uh, some questions that you might be sitting with and thoughts you're having and uh, sort of open the floor up to ask Dr. Cambray, uh, you know, and get some reflections on what you're what you're thinking about, and let's see what we can we can do with this. What you're describing is very exciting. It's it's uh, it's very mutual. It's very real. Yeah. It's often what it feels like. Good. <laughs> um, so I'm s still struck at by how the word infection still comes yeah. into the conversation. Yeah. Is that that <clears throat> defensive language that, yeah. you know, I have to figure out these dreams because that's my job here, and, and if I don't, you'll think I'm an idiot, and you better do it before you, you, know, you leave. Yeah. Well, could be, to be influenced by him. Yes, right. To be vulnerable to him, to have him get to be the person who says, hey, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah. You're wrong here. You're not sure. doing your job. Uh, was, in, was in fact a moment. So mm -hmm. the word infection, I, why not vulnerability? Why yeah, not influence? Yeah. Why not? I don't tend to use the word. I used it here. Okay. So you never use it ever again anywhere else? No, well, no, I, I, no, there are books on psychic infection, and I'm interested yeah. in the question, you know, like how do crowds go crazy? And I mean, just look at politics. If you want psychic infection, you look at it's not just American politics, yeah. but at the moment we have a lot of it. Don't I, get me started. Um, <laughs> but that sense of interaction requires the, the, the ball to bounce off of every so there's no there's no there's only infection when 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 the ball intrudes into something instead of being mutually mm -hmm. Well it, yeah, there's not play. I think that's what you're you're raising is that there the language of infection is a pathologizing language that is used instead of it's playing. Aggressive. Yeah, and it's instead of a playful wow. engagement. Yeah. It's not yeah. interplay. Yeah. So I much prefer a Winnicottian play in terms of the way I actually work with people. I mean, once in a while I get I get you stung with something. Did. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that yeah. can happen. Um, and when I've sometimes when I've mishandled, you know, somebody with a more borderline structure in their personality, um, if you misstep, the level of anger and rage that may come, come at you is a lot harder to metabolize, and that feels much more in those moments like an infection. I mean, suddenly it's like, ugh. You know, and th then there's no play left. I mean, then, you know, you're sort of in this claustrum, and you've got to, you've got to work your way back out and of that. And the chaos takes and over. the affect is overwhelming. Yeah. So it's, yeah it's, you can't yeah. get back in. Yeah, you've got to let the waves just pass over for a little bit. Yeah. Was it pathological? I mean, he said it's necessary, but was it a, did it have a shade? Yeah, he had, had a shade of pathology in his, I mean, he, he, he was double-edged about it because he said, well, there's, there, that's the way he understood transference, is that there's no way you can be effective unless you are impacted, unless you yourself also become, you have to cure yourself, you have to get infected by the patient, experience their illness from the inside, as part of the trans the transference of the illness, this, the original images around um, transference, I, I believe, they actually go back to Ferenczi, and the Hungarians had these trees where they would, if somebody was ill, you'd um, rub a rag on the, the sore spot and then you'd put it on these trees, and it was a transfer, to as a kind of a magical transfer to uh, a healing object, and that's where Freud originally got the term from, uh, and recognized that this was a kind of a psychic equivalent of that. And Jung was talking about it. It was still, it's, it's a one-person model of the psyche. That's the problem. See, with the field, if there's an in quote infection, it's in the field, and everybody's contributing to it. It isn't my patient's fault any more than it's my fault. It's that we're entering into a, sometimes a folly I do that, that energizes the field in some ways like this. So I, I would find him leaping past uh, the, the um, you know, sort of uh, uni, uh, 
bipolar psyche, the, the one person psyche, uh, into field models, but then not holding them, and they move back. Which I think a lot of the early literature, you see that kind of leaps forward, and then there isn't the kind of culture or language to support the move. I mean, we're in much better shape at this point, being 100 years out. We've got a lot more um, skill and background about these kind of states of mind, so we have better tools than, than the pioneers had. The you using a vaccine inoculation model. Yeah, 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 yeah. And that's one of the ways to think about it. I mean, um, I, I've become very interested in the human microbiome. You know, that this is, you know, there's, this all, there's a lot of evidence now that uh, since the, um, the full transcription of the human genome, that number one, the shock was that there were only about 23 to 25,000 genes that make up the human blueprint. We thought there were a couple hundred thousand going into that. You know, it's like, whoa, humans are a lot, at the genetic level, a lot smaller. Well, if you look at all of the material on us, include all of the bacteria, the fungi, the viruses, and all of that stuff, you know, it's, it's a huge proportion, somewhere between 50 and 90% of us, not by weight, but by cell, cell count. But if you look genetically, that's where it's, you carry on you something like 8 million genes, of which 23,000, 25,000 max, are human genes. All of the rest, from 25,000 up to 8 million, are all genes that are not human in their fundamental structure. So we are an infected field. I mean, there, you know, we, once you begin to think in terms of that kind of ecology, that we are an ecology, and I'm much more ecological now in my thinking, then these kind of questions about infection change. They become radically different questions. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I wonder if you could elaborate more on kind of this mother-child infant relationship and how that plays into the field. Yeah, I mean, he, uh, the work of his I like in particular has been the cross-cultural studies. You know, because he's kind of, he was part of the Boston Process of Change study group. These are the people who came up with the moments of meeting. You, do most of you know that, that fundamental model that you're in a kind of therapy and you're talking about things and then you start to reach the place where it starts to become a little more present. You start to be talking about things that move into the now. And if you stay with that, then more affect starts to come in about you and the, the patient. And finally, you can crescendo to what they call a moment of meeting, where there's an anticipatory expectation about how you're going to respond. And if you're in tune with this, and you as the therapist don't deliver the pathogenic response, there's a whole restructuring that can happen very quickly in the psyche because now th there's a new object there that's offering something um, fundamentally different. And it gives the person, this is the dissolving the defenses, reorganizing, emergent, emergentist model. So Trana came from the study of that kind of stuff. And he began to look across cultures, mothers in Africa, mothers in this culture, that culture, with radically different child raising uh, experiences, some of which we would find hard to watch. You know, from a Western, you know, North American kind of perspective, you, you see that and you go, oh, that, that must be horrible for the child. It's not, of course. <clears throat> and what he began to look at is the way in which mothers and babies have, um, uh, you know, sort of miscommunications and then repairs. Part of what he came to was that we have a lot more uh, error and misread than we'd ever thought, the best of mothers. So the fantasy of this, even the Winnicottian good enough mother, needed to be revised to really look much more fully at the way in which um, the capacity for flexibility and repair is really what's essential rather than getting it right. What a relief for therapists. 
<laughs> you know, that it isn't, it's about being attuned to when you're making, when, when you're getting these kind of derivative cues that are telling you that something's off. And when you make the repair, this comes to the point, when you make the repair and it's felt by the other, there's a sense for both individuals that we're in something larger. So there is a repair, I say, oh wow, something just opened up. Oftentimes you'll see kind of changes in um, children's capacity. Suddenly they'll have certain kind of language that comes available after these kinds of experiences. It's like the brain starts reorganizing itself uh, through these kinds of processes. And so with all of the studies of the last 25, 30 years on neuroplasticity, that is we as adults in our brains still make neurals, neural cells and they still grow neuro new neural connections unlike what we had all learned back in the 60s and 70s, uh, for those of you old enough. Um, <laughs> Uh, with that neuroplasticity, there is a real sense that psychotherapy probably at a very basic fundamental level involves some restructuring of the, of the brain as well as the mind, as I separate them, and that these kind of reparative experiences open up a dyadic field uh, and you get something. That, and that expansion is, in my mind, towards a, a new third that encompasses both mother and infant. That's why, you know, my wife's interested in this uh, from a, a kind of art historical perspective. And she's very interested in these pictures of where um, St. Anne, there's the, the virgin and the baby, and then there's St. Anne with a cape, the, the grandmother who's got this cape enfolding both of them as a kind of model of this kind of umbrella that holds in the deeper background. And something that we've lost with um, uh, our, you know, sort of nuclear families where we've lost the kind of multi-generational holding that can happen. Mm -hmm. So that oftentimes I know in therapy that feeling of grandparents is often a, a very important component in the treatment. And what is that? What is the psychic object that's being evoked through the grandparent? I think it has something to do with this sense of larger holding of these, something that can hold this expansion of consciousness. So yeah. it's a great question. Yeah, sure. Well, first off, I, I you know, I was sort of stunned, and I, I let, I don't always filter all my affect out. I, I you know, I look surprised, and, and I sat back and I said, let me think for a minute, and I, I thought about it, and I said, I think you're right. I mean, I, I said, I apologize. I didn't, that wasn't the intention, obviously, but I think you're right that that in some way, and what I could get at was beginning to go at his passivity which was also fundamental. W what was happening is we were getting split, it, we were, the dyad was being polarized, where he was becoming more and more the passive infant and I was becoming an overactive mother in that kind of thing. So I was feeding him every week and giving him lots of rich, good food that he couldn't digest. I mean, if you want that kind of Kleinian metaphor. And, and so what I did was I began to try to be much closer to what he could follow and what was he working on. and transfer responsibility back to him in a way that was measured and that could go at a pace that was acceptable for him. It got us into a lot more of his anger, his passivity, the history of aggression against him that um, he just absorbed and, you know, that he didn't know what to do with. So that was the kind of um, thing that had to get into the field. And I could say that, you know, perhaps, uh, you know, this, this question of the defense against his aggression may have been operating for me. I may have been being too active to, to in some way ward off the levels of rage that were there. And so I think that's the other thing that I, I had to let him really experience much more of his anger, the full weight of his anger, and take that without being destroyed. You know, it was one of those Winnicottian moments where, you know, you, he needs to destroy me and for me to survive and still keep an analytic thought and go, okay, yeah. That was the that was slow, hard work at that point. Um, when you're talking about a, a patient um, trying to uh, destroy us, uh, destroy, and how do we survive, it does bring me back to um, working with borderline uh, patients, and which is something that I, I um, for myself, within myself, that feeling of I can't do or say anything right. And if you... Uh, I yes. just actually stopped for myself, stopped working with borderline patients. And um, mm -hmm. I understand that, that you do work with them, others here do. And what is, 
I just didn't, I had no idea what to do. And I'm just very curious uh, what, to, what the approach, when someone's trying to destroy you or, or they feel that you're trying to destroy them and there's a battle, there's a war, and um, I just didn't know how to do it. Well, it took a lot of good supervision. I mean, I, I had to seek out people, because on my own, I was not going to discover some key. There's no interpretation. I mean, you're often double-bound. No matter what you say, it's and wrong. also, can they heal? I'm also very interested in that. Mm -hmm. Very interested. Yeah, I think there are. The, the question of what are the limitations of the methodology, and what are my limitations? I mean, I, I would personalize that and say, I know, for example, I don't work well with alcoholics. I just, yeah. I just know, you know, somehow I try, but it just doesn't go very well. active or because some, someone's in recovery, they can be totally amazing. Yeah, amazing. no, it's more when they're active, it, yeah, when yeah. they're at that phase. Yeah. I, I find it, it's so refractory that I have a yeah. hard time being fundamentally patient enough. I mean, but that's my, you know, my limitation, not theirs. I don't think they're untreatable, but they may be untreatable by me in those moments. Mm -hmm. And with, with the rage of the borderlines, um, you know, it's, I mean, that's, that's about personal history, you know, the, the kind of knowing those states of mind, whether it's in oneself or in family members and how that was processed or not processed, you know. So I, I think it takes a pretty thoroughgoing exploration of aggression and, you know, developing a certain amount of comfort with that. They're not my favorite patients. I mean, I don't rush around trying to fill up my have practice. You found, have you found um, healing with this? Yeah, um, yeah, with some. I, when you were able I had to some failures stay as well. It, stay yeah. with it? Uh -huh. It takes about two years. I do much better if the borderline structure is fundamentally based on trauma. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, there are other cases where that's not so much. The, the, there are other things that are going on. If it's trauma-based, there's a kind of empathy I can get into uh -huh. that allows me to hold the case despite what might be appearing on the surface. When I don't have an empathic hook, then I, that's where I'm at sea. And, you know, sometimes it, it wears the empathy thin and for a while. And, uh, you know, I can't claim 100% uh, cure rate at all with this kind of patient, maybe 60% or so. And I try, what I try to do is fairly early on figure out, is this, is this getting into a momentary impasse? Or how do impasses go? And I look for micro impasses because they're often cues as to, as we get deeper, this, the tendency to get into certain kind of impasses is going to, become more intensified. So the question then for me becomes, um, how do we resolve the impasses? And if I can see that this patient and I have a way of being with one another, talking with one another, that allows us to be able to get into a, a tangle and then relax and open up, if there's that kind of rhythm, then I feel okay. Then I often feel like, yeah, I'll, I can probably go the distance with this patient. Mm -hmm. There's something in them that can do this. Whereas if it's somebody who just only can hammer away and that there it's every every statement is a life and death um, statement is it gets really hard you know people who are genuinely paranoid they often don't come into treatment but when they do empathy doesn't work it, it's empathy quite work. you have to be very cool and rational with them I my very first one of my very earliest clinical experiences I was at Parkland Hospital in Dallas doing an internship and thank God I had this very very savvy Navy captain ex-Navy captain as a psychiatrist of, um, of the unit. And I had somebody in there, uh, and I tried to be empathic, and the person just became enraged. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, and it's like, I, it scared me, because I, I thought, what have I done here? You know, I mean, I, was, this, I, I didn't say anything caustic, or I wasn't being aggressive, or anything like that. And he said, no, no, this is a paranoid structure. You got too close. And one of the worst things for somebody who's feeling paranoid is that somebody's going to get inside their defenses. So you went way too fast. And that was a really key learning for me at that point. I and thought, he recommended that you stay kind of cool? Yeah, he said, yeah, yeah. He said be, more, be more detached. Uh -huh. Just go in there and just get the facts. Get the facts. Because this person will, and he did, and the guy relaxed. As soon as I started being much more factual, then I was safer. I wasn't probing inside of his psychic structure. And he could then, the, the paranoid sector moved more, receded more to the background. But any attempt at intimacy, which felt like the natural direction for me as a therapist, really was counterindicated there. Mm. Yeah. Uh, so, sort of related uh, question. And uh, I, I was thinking about, I can't remember exact words that you used, but basically my impression is that you were talking about um, disorganization or some disorganized okay. thing. Uh, yeah. And 
chaos. Very chaos, very yeah. helpful and therapeutic. Yes. And um, so, so I was thinking, you know, usually I'm, I'm a little bit more risk averse and um, kind of like do no harm approach. Uh, but at the same mm. time, I noticed that this is, you know, a, a weakness as well. Yeah. So I was wondering, what are some of the factors or the things that would prompt you to be a little bit, uh, will probably lean more toward like a, this organization side as opposed to what other factors would prompt you to lean more toward the sort of safer organized side? Yeah, so part of that, it's, it's a kind of a double vision. One is paying attention to the psychic state of the, the client. Um, are they highly disorganized? You know, in other words, if somebody's coming in with a lot of chaotic stuff, like the Black Forest Woman, I mean, the sentences were barely one on the other. That were, they were almost jumping from here to there. To, so you could feel the disorganization straight away. Uh, and you could see the counter-transference reaction was to compensate for that by beginning to structure an order. Too much so in that case, as far as I'm concerned. You know, at least what I did at the first move. But what I'm talking about, and this goes back to Heinrich Racker, looking at complementary and comp compensatory transference, counter-transference relationships. So looking at what's happening with the patient and looking at myself. And how am I interacting? Am I joining with them in a kind of empathic unity? Or am I getting into the opposite position? They're manic, I feel depressed. You know, that would be the opposite pole. Uh, and so before I intervene, kind of being able to read psychologically where both of, our, where both of us are at and where's a kind of balance point for that. So if, for example, somebody's all over the place and they're kind of manic in their presentation and I'm getting more and more sort of depressed, I, I won't try to just slow them down because I realize, you know, that's, that's going to be the depressive counterweight and it's not going to serve. There's got to be a more measured, uh, slower pace to saying, oh, what about that? Or what about that? I mean, to try to catch something where their libido is going and bring that gently bring that back in, sort of fold that back in, and that that begins to have an ordering effect on somebody like that, for example. So then the depressive slowing is not to um, try to stop the, the flow of the narrative, it's to try to give it a little shape. That would be an example. Maybe you could extend that into the, um, the case that you've written about uh, Melanie and, yeah. and, the, and psychosis, because I think that would be interesting yeah, for people right. to hear about, and sort of how that works in terms of, if you think of psychosis as a both a disorganized state, but also, uh, you know, an imagistic state. Right. Um, maybe we could talk a little bit about okay, that so in this, terms of the field. Yeah, this would be, uh, there are a couple of dreams that I can, can give that maybe that'll help clarify. This was a patient who was bipolar, um, and um, actually it, it's, a, it's a strange case because I heard about it before I had the case. I visited, a, a psychiatrist in the town that I had lived in was interested in Jungian psychology and asked to have lunch together. And during the lunch together, she got a call from the police that one of her patients went missing. So it was a, sort of a bizarre, it, it mm. made a bit of a mess of the lunch. And so we spent the rest of the lunch talking about her case. And, and, and I promptly left and I, I didn't think more about it. And about six months later, um, I got a call about and it turns out it was the same patient wanting to come into treatment with me. Mm. And so I had all of this material and it really had to do with the fact that um, that first break was because her lithium levels had been inadequately monitored. So she came into treatment and there was a lot of anxiety about um, med management and so forth and I was working with a psychiatrist who was very good with that and so we, we got her contained. And then she had a dream. Uh, after we after the therapy settled down and in the dream um, uh, she's in this room with a figure called the beautiful woman uh, it's a kind of uh, self object uh, and, but the woman's dressed all in black and there's a centipede and the woman's very positive about the centipede uh, even though it's crawling on the patient's arm and she says oh look what he can do and, and uh, with that uh, the centipede becomes mm, sort of darker and more unpleasant looking, but opens up this jewel box and there's a red ruby in it. Um, and the, this other figure in the dream says, oh, she loves this, fig she loves this uh, centipede because look what he can do. 
And I was quite anxious. I mean, I heard that dream and I thought, oh boy, we've got another psychotic episode coming. I mean, it was pretty clear to me. She's really going bugs in a way. I mean, this centipede on her. Yeah, yeah I mean, just many different levels. So um, in terms of the countertransference reaction um, and trying not to do any harm, but also really seeing that a psychotic episode was was really in the offing. And I worked with her very carefully around, um, I mean, she, she sensed that she was menaced. And she was someone who was quite frightened of her own psychotic process, rightly so, because it cost her a lot. Um, and so through our work on that dream, when the process broke through at about, about a week later, she, instead, the last time she had, in a uh, anamnestic fit, left the area. It was about three, 400 miles away. She, she was picked up on the street with no identity, you know, no papers or anything. It was really a, a terrible story. This time, she made it to the hospital grounds, collapsed onto the grounds, and the staff got her immediately, brought her in. The last time she was in the hospital for about three months, this time she was in three days. So you can see the process got a lot more contained. Um, and it was about working with the anxiety that I was having. I mean, as soon as I heard that dream, I thought, yeah, there's potential of transformation here, but that, and I assumed the red jewel was the rage that was underneath all of this. And it turns out that that was, in fact, really accurate in the case. Um, so in working with my distress and my anger, <clears throat> which was part of what I had to contain to get her into the hospital and keep her safe, um, I did a lot of work on the centipede, and that was where it became very curious. This is the field piece of this, where rather than trying to make a decision, you know, because later, many, many years later, this woman contacted me and we had a discussion, of, and she wanted to know how I was able to stay with her when she became psychotic, why I didn't drop her from treatment. Mm -hmm. uh, because the tendency would have been to just say, whoa, this is beyond my ability to contain. I'm not a psychiatrist, I'm a psychologist, I'm not going to. Uh, I can't treat somebody like this without meds. Um, the thing that, that held me in that was uh, exploring the image of the centipede. And the narrative that I got a hold of was that in Tahiti, there are two centipedes, and they're seen as the shadows of the medicine gods. Mm -hmm. And if they can be induced to crawl on someone, that person will get well. Mm -hmm. Now, that seems a little bit of a strange and odd misnomer, but what this patient had no idea of was that my first wife, who I was married to at the time, was half Tahitian. And that's in fact how I knew about this stuff. Um, I didn't know it at the time of the dream, but I did some research on it. And that's what contained me, is, is that was where the healing energy was uh, that I had to try to locate in terms of how do I contain uh, this um, outpouring of the imagination that was really threatening her, her mental process, that she was really going to be under so overwhelmed. And the, the sort of kicker to this comes uh, about six months after she returns from the hospital, where she finally tells me the, uh, the inducting dreams for the psychosis. And the first one is um, this dream comes before the amnestic episode. That is, before I, that when I was seeing this other psychiatrist and she had disappeared and all the worry was there. And in that dream, there's, um, she's standing and this, the ground becomes molten and this uh, black fiery woman comes up out of the ground. And the patient's just frozen in terror and this figure walks past her and over onto this other hill where some other people seem to relate to her as a teacher, but the patient is just in this abject terror. Um, and that itself is, I, mean, I won't go through the details of the dream, except to compare it to the dream she had uh, just before she took herself to the hospital on the second time. In this dream, again, a black fiery woman comes up out of the ground. But this time, the patient moves and the figure moves in stride with her. She walks behind her and they walk together uh, across, across the scene. And so what you have is the capacity of the ego there to contain um, an interaction with something that was just unbearable before. You can see it happening in the dream. And I saw that 
I mean, I'd have to unpack the case a lot more, but there was a lot of the therapeutic work that could be mirrored and seen in, the, in that subtle transformation in her abilities to relate to her own psychotic process. So that was the kind of pacing that I had, a, had to learn from that patient. So um, some, of the, some of the chaos and the disorder started to get uh, changed, morphed, by, by part of the imagery that she was getting and the affect that was being somehow transformed. Well, it was getting into relationship with the affect. I don't yeah. know that the affect was completely transformed as much as the, we were finding a pathway from which to be in contact with this. And it had a lot, to be quite honest, the, the sort of lava-like qualities had a lot to do with the rage that had to do with a lot of early historical wounds and, and pain and suffering that she'd had that she was able to more and more bring into the treatment. First she would do things at home with this rage and then she would report them to me and then we'd process what that experience was like and gradually she could begin to bring the actual encounters with this material into the therapy. Yeah. And so that's, but you know I had to learn the pacing from from her, really, in a lot of ways. Doesn't completely answer your question, but it hopefully gives you a bit of a picture of that. So just following my own curiosity here, um, I'm just interested in maybe what some of you are thinking about in terms of how you're imagining yourself using this kind of approach to the work. And if there's any yeah, question that you're sitting with that you're really going to regret that you didn't ask 15 <laughs> minutes from now when we all leave. So, yes. Um, I suppose I get a sense that like a lot of things in, in therapy, a lot of clinicians um, do things without knowing and mm -hmm. have a sense of the field um, at yes. different levels already and different sensitivities. Um, and I'm wondering about the capacity um, to learn to sensitize oneself to something that, that one maybe not already sure. has. Sure, I think there, <clears throat> there are a couple of things there. Um, one is practice and really good supervision. You know, I, I, this is sort of another one of these 10,000 hour rule things, you know, that, that's out in culture. You do, it takes you about 10,000 hours to develop expertise. And sitting with this kind of material and attending to it, you need, you know, say you're doing 2,000 hours of contact hours a year if you're working full time, about five years worth of practice with this where you incorporate this and you have a supervisor who can share uh, that kind of interest. I mean, I sought out several supervisors who I knew knew something about seeing an analytic field and deliberately brought cases to them that I was struggling with finding these kinds of things. So I'd get their kind of input on that. And by the way, in that case, would they talk about the field of supervision that was happening Sometimes. and sort of relate it back to the case? Yeah, yeah, the, the parallel process kinds of things at times if it was relevant. I mean, I myself was conscious of that about which choice, which cases I would choose to bring and why. I mean, sometimes I had a kind of explicit reason and there were other layers to the reasoning that were obviously there. But um, I, I think there's also the question of, of empathy and how is that, obviously our capacity for empathy is, is at least somewhat malleable. I, I mean, I don't think you could train people to be psychotherapists if it were the case. Uh, you know, I have one of the questions I've had to neuroscientists, if you study, uh, you know, the, these, uh, you know, different kinds of cells that um, uh, allow interaction uh, and um, they fire both the mirror neuron types of cells. Is that familiar yeah, language? Okay, neuron. so you know about mirror neurons. Okay, so some people feel, and I, I think there's probably some truth, that they're at the base of um, mm -hmm. uh, empathic experience. They're not, you can't describe it completely with them, but they're fundamental to that. So if that's the case, uh, first off, uh, from uh, you know, uh, a fetal development, what does it look like? What, what are the kind of um, uh, mirror neuron distributions? Because uh, we know that they're different in different species. And then over the course of psychotherapy and psychotherapy training, uh, is there an increasing innervation of these kinds of systems? I believe so. So the uh, practicing, actively practicing empathic understanding, getting into, for example, one of the quickest ways to do this is listen to a dream and try to enter the dream from the perspective of each of the characters in the dream. That will give you uh, some empathic training. What does it look like through the eyes of this figure or that figure, rather than just the egocentric figure? Go to a movie, look at the different characters, try to empathically 
figure out what they're doing. You know, in the humanities, good writers are really wonderful at this. They, you know, the, the memoirs of a geisha is one that comes to mind, you know, uh -huh. where people just couldn't believe a man wrote that because uh -huh. the level of his intuition about the experience was so profound. And I think good literature, I, I don't want to just point to one piece of, about sexism or something like that, but the, the whole way in which uh, writers can evoke in us the experience, the, the kind of nuanced experience, I think is really extraordinarily helpful for therapeutic training. So one of the things that you've written about, which r relates to the latest question, is that the idea of resonance, that, yeah. the, that empathy leads to resonance. Yes. And the deeper that you can resonate, then the more you can tolerate in terms of being present to certain parts of people's experience. Yeah. Yeah. So that's very really important. And there's more to that, I'm sure. Well, resonance is a field phenomenon. Yeah. In other words, if I hit a tuning fork and I have one over here, it's because the sound waves create a field between the two of them. So it, 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 we're already in the language of, of field interactions. That, that, that is that they're not just local. It isn't you've got to touch one with the other. That would be a local interaction. But if you can transmit through a, some kind of medium, there's a field of interaction, then there's, there's a non-locality to this. And I think the psyche does have non-local dimensions much of what I'm saying. Okay, one last question and then we have to stop. Uh, yeah. uh, historically, in psychoanalysis, how do you see that we came to this moment where we talk about the field? Yeah. What happened, what theories <coughs> brought us to this? Or what lack of tools brought us to think this way? Yeah, uh, well there are several strands of, of, of entry. I think Freud's recognition of an unconscious communication through a field, I mean, he talked about the telephone receiver. You know, he talked about listening to the unconscious of the patient as if listening, uh, the telephone was a kind of novelty at the time, it was new. Uh, what's always curious when I read Freud on that is that he has a receiver, he doesn't have a, a mouthpiece. Mm -hmm. As if the analyst had nothing to say back. And we, I think it's a bi-directional field. Um, for me, I go to Jung, and really it goes back to William James, because in the 19th century, the notion of fields really comes from, from physics, classical physics. The, the first experiments were done purely serendipitously, by accident, by Hans Christian Orsted, a Danish uh, physicist who was teaching his students about how you could create an electric current through a wire. You know, that's all he was doing, he just made a battery basically, and passed a wire between it. But the error was that a, ma a magnet, uh, a compass was left on the table. And when he ran the current, the compass jumped. And everybody had thought there was some relationship between electricity and magnetism, but nobody had a clue. And this was the first experimental verification that there must be something going on. There must be an interaction that's invisible that we can't see. And this goes on through Michael Faraday and all of his experiments with electromagnetism, but the, the real genius is James Clerk Maxwell in Scotland, who works out the theory of electromagnetism and light. And William James was reading that in the 1870s. And he has a long passage in the variety of religious experiences where he talks about consciousness being directed by forces outside, turning as if in a magnetic field. He uses this metaphor very explicitly about the way one instance of consciousness transforms into the next through forces outside of our conscious awareness as if like in a magnetic field. Mm -hmm. So, and Jung was very close to James and he picks this up, he actually uses it in one of his essays. He quotes that same passage. Mm -hmm. And so that was another, and he developed a model, once you start moving from a one person to a two person model, you start moving into a field. Then you can talk about unconscious communications and things that are happening between the people then you're, you're in the direction of the field. The discovery of countertransference was probably the single most important component. The use of countertransference is the tool by which you begin to be able to not only access the field, but to impact and, and to be able to work in Countertransference in a Jungian sense. In a Jungian sense. Well, in, a, in an interactive sense. I mean, yeah. I think Ferenczi would have done this, and certainly people like, starting with Paula Heinemann uh, in uh, 1948, or her paper on countertransference, that's where the first that's the very first time in the analytic literature where somebody says, countertransference is useful. <laughs> it's telling us something about our patients. It isn't just to be gotten rid of, which was the old model. And then Harold Searles picks this up and on and on and on until we get into the world of enactments and reverie and all of that. Okay. I think we have to stop, yeah. unfortunately. Okay. Thank you all for coming. And thanks to Thank Dr. You. Kemba. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.